won't go away There's so much that needs to grow today Rain, rain, please don't go away I love H2O Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Master Rain Gardener Certification class. This is where we will teach you to design your own rain garden. By the end of class, you'll have a rain garden all planned out for your very own yard. This is Susan Bryan. I am here with Harry Sheehan, Deputy Water Resources Commissioner for Washtenaw County. Hello. Shan Shannon Give Randall, Principal of Insight Design Studio here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Also Howdy. with us today is Evan Pratt, Water Resources Commissioner, and our Water Quality Specialist, Katie White Dechek. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hey, Susan. Good afternoon. Hello. Hey, Susan. Hello. Well, so today we have a, a jam-packed session prepared for you. Let's first off talk about what is a rain garden? What are we here talking about? To start with, a rain garden is a garden that does double duty. It soaks in the water that comes from the, that rains from the sky, and it also soaks in water that may fall on any hard surface around your home, like the roof or the driveway. And it, the, all that water goes into the rain garden and soaks into the soil there in the rain garden. The, the, the soil in the rain garden actually degrades and eats any petrochemical pollution that's in the rain garden. So your little rain garden protects our freshwater resources. Your little garden protects the river. And also it creates habitat. That's the amazing thing that a rain garden does. So we're going to teach you how to design your own rain garden and build it. Not only that, you will know so much about rain gardens, you will be a resource for your neighborhood. People will come to you for advice about rain gardens, and you will know the answer. All right, so this is a first of a five-part series, step-by-step step during this class. Um, if you do all the homework, which is in little incremental steps, by the end, you'll have designed your own custom-designed rain garden, designed by you. Today we'll focus on what is a rain garden, the different parts, show the steps one person took to build one, and then why they're important. Next week uh, in class number two, we'll talk about planning the rain garden, how big the rain garden should be, and tips and tricks to conquer some common obstacles. Third class, we'll talk about digging, how to keep that topsoil in the rain garden instead of digging it all out. <laughs> And uh, fourth class, we'll talk about planting design. Uh, there's so many plants to choose from, how to choose the plants that will do well in your rain garden. Then the last class, we'll take some of your designs that you've worked out and workshop them and give you feedback. All the classes will have a segment on plants of the day. So even by the end of this class, you'll have some go-to plants that will do amazingly well in any rain garden. And then also we'll get some master rain gardener alumni to come back and tell their story about how they built a rain garden. So by the end of the class, you'll have seen lots of rain gardens built and you'll really be able to, you'll be worthy of the title master rain gardener. Just a little bit about me. My name is Susan Bryan. I'm a landscape architect. I'm a master gardener. And I used to work in residential landscape design, so I've worked with many residential clients. I also got the opportunity to design the rain gardens along Miller Avenue in Western Ann Arbor. And now I focus on getting other people excited about stormwater about, by developing the Master Rain Gardener certification class. So what kind of gardener are you? Thank you so much, everyone, for being a good sport and answering my question about gardening, because I wanted to get to know you a little bit. All right, so there are master gardeners here from Washtenaw, Wayne, Oakland, Kalamazoo, Grand County, and I'm so glad that they're here because it's great to have some experts in the room as well because rain gardening is just gardening. Also, there's some master composters in the room. I bet you didn't even know that was a thing, but it is, and uh, compost is actually going to loom large in this class as well. There's vegetable gardeners in the room. There are native plant gardeners in the room. Also, there's permaculturalists and um, small farmers in the room. Teachers, I'm so glad that some teachers decided to take this class this week because building a rain garden on a school is a fantastic project. Also, there's a bunch of people who said, I'm a beginner, I'm a novice, I'm a black thumb, and that is okay because remember all those master gardeners? You can ask them questions. And we'll all be chatting together. This is the lecture portion of the class, but there's also a discussion portion. And that will be taking place on the, mass, on the Facebook, Master Rain Gardener Facebook group. So it's just a group 
where we're discussing rain gardens, or on the Garden Web Great Lakes Gardening Forum if you don't do Facebook. So either one of those will be good places for you to post pictures of your plans and then people will give you feedback, not just the teachers here today, but also Master Rain Gardener alumni will be chiming in and they are fresh from building their own rain garden. So um, they have some hard earned lessons are hard earned lessons learned they will share with you and maybe give you some good advice. So I'll send you an email with links on how to join those forums and I just want to give a shout out to Master Rain Gardener alumni who are helping people um, on the forums and get, just get a handle on like how are you going to do this, what's the easiest way, there's no reason to do it the hard way. All right, during class, if you have questions, feel free to chat in your questions and uh, Katie Wydicek as well as the other panelists will be answering them on chat. And if there's some questions that come up that maybe everyone needs answers, we'll actually answer it right here verbally too. So keep that in mind. All right, so today I'm going to go over sort of the class expectations. Harry Sheehan and Evan Pratt will talk about why. Why is a rain garden important? What's that big environmental problem that we're trying to solve? I'll go over sort of the overarching story of a rain garden. What's the whole process when you're building a rain garden? And Shannon Gibb Randall will talk about plants of the day that we'll go over today. And then at the very end, I'll go over the homework assignment because we have homework. This is a real class, man. All right, so what do we expect from you out of this class? Well, we hope that you will build a rain garden, just like Lori Sprague did here in Dexter. She's so happy. Shar Tavarazi in Wayne County built this beautiful rain garden. Build a beautiful rain garden. And join the Master Rain Gardener Hall of Fame. Look, there's a spot right there for your garden to fill in. <laughs> really, um, it's something that every, if everyone did it, we'd solve a huge problem. So that's our job here. So through class, we'll take you step by step through the process of designing a rain garden. So first, you'll figure out where to put your rain garden. Helen here was planting hers in the wintertime, so she just sketched on the snow, which is kind of handy. Uh, then make a plan. So figure out what the shape is going to be, how is the water going to get there, what are all the plants that you're going to use, the um, make a plant list, build it, which is just one picture here, but <laughs> there's a lot of digging and compost, mixing in compost and mulching and then planting, all of that. And if you'd like one and you live in Michigan, I'll send you a sign if you'd like a sign. And then also um, I'll send you a t-shirt so you can wear it with pride and fulfill all of the, get all of, all of the honor and glory that you <laughs> get with being a master rain gardener. Um, because we really want people to ask you questions about it. They want to see your t-shirt. We want them to see your t-shirt and ask you, what's a rain garden? How does that work? All right, so to tell, to t take us back a few steps and talk about why rain gardens are important. This is Harry Sheehan here from the, he's the Deputy Water Resources Commissioner in Washtenaw County, Michigan. And Harry's the big picture guy, figuring out what projects will benefit our community um, by solving some of these big freshwater uh, quality issues. So like Susan said, my name is Harry Sheehan. I'm the Deputy, uh, there we go. I'm the uh, Deputy of Environmental Services, which is kind of a mouthful here at the Washington County Water Resources Office. Um, I still have to explain what it is to my mother, I do, but in a nutshell, our job is to basically keep the rivers and, and lakes clean. And we have a variety of pollution prevention programs um, that we have in place. We ha have done stream bank restoration, which is helpful for habitat and water quality. But more to the point today, we've done a bunch of projects that store stormwater. When it rains, a lot of water leaves the landscape. It comes out of our neighborhoods and our streets, and it comes rushing down the storm sewers and into our creeks. So we've created these large holding areas where we capture and treat stormwater. And in fact, in some of these, we try to infiltrate it into the ground like this one at Pioneer High School. And we've done that on the surface as well, if any of you have been to Mary Beth Doyle Park here in Ann Arbor big kind of safety valve to treat water when it rains and to get the pollutants and sediments to fall out and obviously done with native landscaping here as well. Well one way to do that large-scale treatment, that big job that Susan mentioned, was to build big pieces of infrastructure. But we run out of room to do that and it's very expensive. So the other way to look at that is to do a lot of little pieces of infrastructure and that's where you come in. So since 2005 we've been building hundreds of rain gardens here in Washtenaw County and elsewhere. 
This is one that I put in last year. This is from May of last year uh, in my backyard. And after our first rainstorm, of course, I ran out and took some pictures and video. And that's probably closer to the beginning of August. So that's the scale of rain garden that we're talking about in backyards. So this is all about stormwater management, and I'm going to go over the big picture of stormwater management, starting with what it is. Since the days of the Romans, when they started building uh, storm sewers, this has been an issue. You build rooftops, you build villages um, that have a lot of cover, roads and rooftops, and you have to have a place for that stormwater to go. So you can see in this picture, I think you can, that they put in culverts. So to be clear, this is the water that's falling outside of your house. This is water that falls on the roof, on the yard, and it runs down your driveway, or it runs uh, into a curb on the street, or it runs into a swale and into the um, river. This is not the potable water you use in your house that comes from your well or from the drinking water plant that you use, and then it goes uh, out a pipe in your house. That system is the sanitary system, and that's what this picture represents. So sanitary systems are directly connected to your home, uh, to your kitchen sink, to your drain, to your bathroom, bathroom and that discharge water goes into these storm sewer, these sanitary sewers here, excuse me, and it goes down to a low point and then on the way to the, to the wastewater treatment plant where we pay to have it cleaned thoroughly before it's discharged to the river. The stormwater system is different. The stormwater system starts at your curb drain in the street and it goes downhill, but we do not pay to have it treated. It goes right past the wastewater treatment plant. It's directly piped to the river. And you'll recognize in the rural area, obviously you don't have storm sewers, um, but you do have roadside ditches, so fairly common. And in the background there, it goes into a, the nearby creek. We're very lucky that we have these two separate systems, because if we didn't, we'd have to send all of our water to the wastewater treatment plant, because there would be one pipe, and it would carry rain and sanitary water, and it would all be polluted. So it's quite a uh, large-scale um, process to clean all that. And this is a picture uh, just on the south side of Chicago. That's I-80 in the uh, foreground and there's a big old gravel pit where they hold this water after it rains and they queue it up to be treated in the wastewater treatment plant. So we don't have that problem, but we do have the obligation to keep our rainwater clean. So what's the problem with rainwater? It falls clean, um, but when it hits the landscape, it really tends to pick up everything that we left behind. Water has an extraordinary quality of just mobilizing things and dissolving things and bringing it downstream. What are some of those things? Well, sediment's a big one. Um, even after just a little storm, you'll see little bits of sediment, and you can ex uh, expand this out to the watershed level, and you can see that it's going to be a lot. Um, there's nutrients, there's a lot of uh, leaf organic material, there's cigarette butts and all kinds of debris, but there's also the things that come off of our landscape. Um, you can see them when it snows. It starts out white and it turns dark pretty quickly, and that's from tire wear and stuff coming off the asphalt. We've all seen this at construction sites where the, the black silt fence isn't quite put up right or it's just overwhelmed by stormwater flow, and you get erosion that way. Uh, we clean up after our dogs these days, but um, not everywhere and not 100%. There's a lot of E. coli and pet waste that kind of lands on the landscape. And we have urban wildlife. You've all seen um, by the river or down by the lake, you've seen uh, uh, geese. Um, and what they leave behind, and raccoons in our storm sewers. So there's a lot of E. coli in that. And then we've seen these in parking lots, too, where there's puddles after it rains, and you can see just a little bit of oil and grease will really um, kind of make its way into the water and um, into the creek as well. Lawns are a big source because you have herbicides, pesticides, all sorts of chemicals that go on our lawns as well. So these are kind of the accumulation of sources that we have. And if it's dry for a while or if there's snow on the ground, it piles up and it all washes off at once. And we call that the first flush. And it's kind of like um, a release of pollution. So if you expand it out to a watershed, you know, a watershed is where uh, all the rain that falls in a certain area goes to one point. And that point is the mouth of a river or a creek. And in this case, this is the Grand River after a major storm. And you can see, see the effect um, coming off into Lake Michigan. And I think for a little more detail, I'm going to bring in our special correspondent, Evan Pratt. 
your Washington County Water Resource Commissioner. Evan, are you there? Very much uh, for cutting to the cutting to me on the sidelines. Uh, you're talking about what more and more scientists are calling the biggest remaining source of pollutant loading to our rivers, lakes, and streams. And first off, uh, just as we're almost we're almost to the rain garden part, folks. I want to thank all of our rain gardeners and future rain gardeners. You're our last line of defense for what's essentially drainage that primarily comes through road systems comes off the landscapes, uh, flows uh, into and collects in these areas. And I'll just give you a little example from my house. I'm not a neat freak, as my wife will say, but we've got dogs. They track things into the house from our attached garage. So I sweep out the garage once in a while. I get about three quarters of a cup of dirt, maybe every three, four weeks, kind of just like this little pile here uh, that you see on the photo. Um, and that looks pretty harmless. Uh, in, in the words of Tommy Chong, don't look dangerous to me. But Really, what's connected to that stuff is a lot of pollutant load that people uh, may not be aware of, such as little flakes of zinc come off of car tires. Uh, catalytic converters are an excellent source of magnesium and cadmium, which are really not healthy to uh, swallow too much of. So what, uh, what sorts of things are latching on to the dirt particles is important, but it's also important to understand my little three quarters of cup of a month of pollutant load times the 20,000 garages in my community adds up and that's just what gets in the garage that's not even uh, accounting for what's on the street so certainly back to that big picture Harry showed of a giant plume of sediment that has uh, chemicals and phosphorus attached to it in Lake Michigan is pretty important to understand uh, where you all fit in and again we appreciate it in fact uh, there's a number of things such as the what they call polyaromatic hydrocarbons. This is coal tar that's used to seal driveways. That's pretty bad. And maybe with a little tip of the hat to a fellow named Tom Lehrer, I'd like to just identify a few other things that are out there. Please do. Good the dirt particles. I think there's phosphorus and nitrogen and hydrocarbon polymers, selenium and manganese and iron and zirconium, nickel, zinc and arsenic and chromium and cadmium. Don't forget biological oxygen demand. Da, 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 thank you. Thank you very much, Evan. I'm going to work on my beatbox uh, for future presentations. So um, that provides you a little bit more of the detail. And Evan went to MIT, so you can believe him. Um, he went on a rugby scholarship, wasn't it, Evan? <laughs> He's gone. Something like that. Yeah. Um, so, okay, uh, getting back to the, the scale, I think uh, we got through those. So just remember that um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you picture the, the water leaving your, your roadside swale or the curb catch basin, that is all going directly to your creek, not to the wastewater treatment plant. And it really is hard to draw that line for some people because you know it goes into a pipe and it disappears but this is what the other end of that looks like and we have a video to show of what uh, what a drastic change that makes at the outlet of the creek this is Allen Creek here in Ann Arbor and most days you can barely see any water coming out of that pipe and that pipe is big enough to stand in and this is what it looks like just after a regular old uh, thunderstorm so Katie's gonna send you a link to this video because if you put it on the, the webinar it just doesn't show right but please take a, uh, a second to look at that it's really quite impressive and you can see it's it's whitewater it's it's uh, surfs up time in Allen Creek there the most obvious manifestation of this water quality problem is algae blooms and we all know about the algae blooms in Western Lake Erie Basin or the Toledo area and how that affected drinking water a few years ago but it's really any lake any shallow water area in Michigan, algae blooms. And that's not the only problem that we have. We have uh, changes in the chemical composition of the water and the temperature and the pH and the habitat. It, it's all linked to this watershed pollution, this stormwater runoff, which is the number one source of pollution that we have uh, throughout the country. Now, this isn't to say that all our lakes are horrible. They're not. This is a picture of Lake Superior, and you can tell it's quite nice. Um, this is the least populated and biggest lake, um, and it has the least amount of problems when it comes to stormwater pollution. Lake Erie is the exact opposite. Small lake, lots of people, lots of agriculture. But our Great Lakes are pretty clean, um, particularly uh, after, a series, or after a period of dry weather. 
and that is true of our Huron River too. Our Huron River flows through southeast Michigan. Most days it is a perfectly fine river to recreate in. We get tens and tens of thousands of people uh, canoeing, kayaking, swimming, fishing. There's, there's fly fishing in, in Huron River. If you're in moving water and it hasn't rained in the last day or two, um, you don't have to worry about the pathogens in the E. coli, and that's really the primary concern in this river. That's all the water quality problem. The other half of this equation is the amount of water that runs off the landscape. So even if our water was clean when it runs off our streets and parking lots, there's just more of it. If you pave space, that water can't get into the ground. And back in the day, we'd get 30, 33 inches of rain in Michigan, and that water would get soaked up into the forest or prairie system, and very little of it would run off. It would have to be a pretty big rainstorm to do that. And you can still see in places in Michigan where, the, you know, there's areas of naturalized landscape. You can tell that in the creek. The creeks are stable. They're shady. They don't fluctuate a lot. There's good debris, woody debris in there, habitat, pools, ripples. It's all good fishing. But once you start to build on it, you get about 10% imperviousness just with one acre lots, and your creek becomes a conveyance system, and you can see that in the creek. The roots get exposed because the banks are getting eroded. You can see that in the background there. Trees start to lean over and fall in. You get a lot more woody debris. You get a lot of sedimentation, um, erosion and sedimentation in the creek. And that has its impact on habitat. And the extreme example of that is here in a place like Ann Arbor where you get 40 and 50 and 60% impervious. And the water running off the landscape really is just being conveyed directly to the creek. And it's the creek is like a chan uh, pipe at that point, it needs to make itself bigger, so it cuts itself wider and deeper, and it takes with it a lot of material. And you can picture that that is not the best thing for habitat. Here's another example of that, just from an aerial standpoint, or aerial, aerial uh, bird's eye view. This is the Briarwood Mall area, if you're familiar with Ann Arbor, uh, just out uh, inside the I-94 ring. This is 1952. You can see two tributaries of Mallets Creek going through this area, farm fields. And this is what it looked like in 2013. So it's quite a contrast. And you can picture if you were a raindrop falling from the sky from this perspective, uh, the chances that you'd land on pavement and get piped directly to the creek are pretty high. Hey, Harry, so, um, when I yeah. see those pictures, I often think to myself, oh, look at all those little green spots where I could put a rain garden there. You know, there's actually little places, even in that huge, massive parking lot, where there's a spot where, hey, that rain garden could go right there. Absolutely. And we're looking at all sorts of um, places, like the clover leaf that you see on the highway. There's, there's one of those in Ann Arbor that's up for possible stormwater um, management as well. Interesting about this picture, that's the first, those are the first stormwater ponds built in Ann Arbor, too. That was about 1977, where we realized that we had to start detaining this stuff. And this yeah, is good point, Susan. This isn't just true of Ann Arbor. I mean, these are yeah. common for to anywhere in anywhere in Michigan and anywhere in the in um, North America, actually. Yeah, but I like your glass half full approach to this slide. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of parking lot there. <laughs> there is. All right. Uh -huh. So Shannon is familiar with this site. This is the city of Ann Arbor's city hall. So this gives you an example of the kind of more progressive infrastructure that we're trying to build instead of just the, your standard stormwater pond which is better than nothing, but why not use the water that's falling on the landscape for landscaping? So in this picture, we have some patio areas and some rooftop areas in City Hall uh, where you have gardens. It's a green roof. And um, in the parking lot, instead of having asphalt, in this case, we have porous pavers. So the water infiltrates into the seams in the porous pavement and down into a stone reservoir underneath. So a very effective way to do stormwater management there. But here's what we're talking about is capture it at the source. And the easiest way to do that, um, particularly on residential land, is rain gardens. Instead of having water treated as a byproduct of having a house and a garage and a, and a driveway, treat it like a resource. Grab that water. Use it. Use it to grow things. Use it to infiltrate water into the roots of these water-loving plants and um, recharge the groundwater. So that's the hydraulic piece. So the, the two components that we're trying to uh, deal with of this larger problem is water quality and the hydrology, the fact that the water just can't get into the ground anymore. And this is a big problem. It's a landscape scale problem, but 
every little piece helps. And when you build your rain garden, you'll be contributing to a larger group of community uh, people, a community, and some larger public projects where little by little, we're capturing this water, getting it into the ground. And we're actually starting to see this in some of the places where we have stream gauges that are measuring the reaction to uh, runoff. So if you do your bit, you're going to be able to solve the water quality problem in the bottom left where the water is infiltrated, cleansed, sent into the groundwater, and the flooding problem in the top here. So your water will not be contributing to flooding in the low spots in your town or city. I'll close people can with totally, People can totally help out their neighbor this way. You know, if, yes. if, you're, if your neighbor's getting flooded, you can capture some of that water yourself, and then you're helping out your neighbor. Right. And rain gardens in and of themselves are not a flooding solution, but if you got dozens and dozens and tens and hundreds, it starts to add up. And we're starting to see that. So I'll close with just this picture that illustrates, you know, how a tiny little rain garden can do a great deal of work. If you plot all the rainy days, sorry, we're going to use a graph. Um, if you plot all the rainy days over the course of the year, it has this blue arcing curve on the graph. And if you go to the half inch on the bottom, this is an inch, two inch, three inch, four inch, five inches on the bottom there. And that's uh, how much rain would fall in any given storm. Most storms, 85% of them are below a half an inch. So that is kind of the magic mark that uh, we've set as the objective of our rain garden. So it minimizes the digging and you get the smallest garden and your biggest bang for the buck. And I think I'll pass it back to Susan at this point because I think she has an example of exactly this type of rain garden. That's right. Thank you so much, Harry. Um, the, so I just wanted to point out, here's a tiny rain garden um, that was built by uh, Mallory Wachelski here from our office. And her tiny rain garden um, actually captures all of the water from her patio there. So you can see that it's a small patio, it's not that big, but the water runs off and goes into her little rain garden and um, soaks it right into the ground. So even if you're putting in a tiny rain garden or if you start getting inspired by all of this and start looking around your yard and thinking, oh, wait, here's another little spot where I could capture some water. Here's another little spot where I could capture some water. Those all contribute to the whole. And I love it how um, when Harry was talking about some of the things that harm some of our fresh water in lakes and streams, like nutrients and organic matter, those are great things for a garden. Actually, they help our garden. So it's really a matter of just putting the right things in the right spot. Some, some things that we don't want in water are great for gardens. All right. So that's why, that's the big picture. That's why we'll, I'll send you a sign if you build a rain garden. The sign says, helping the river, one garden at a time. So that way you have a moment where your neighbors will ask you about it. We want you to become an ambassador for rain gardens. Also, we want you to build a beautiful rain garden. So if you have a rain garden and you put in your sign and then you stop weeding it and it starts looking not so great, you should take down your sign because <laughs> we want everyone to do it. Um, so be, a, be an ambassador for rain gardens. Something that Maureen Frey did, um, a master rain gardener from a couple of years ago, she had a sort of ribbon cutting ceremony for that she invited her neighbors over and they had um, coffee and donuts and had a sort of a grand opening for her rain garden. That was super fun. Or Roger Moon, who invited a garden club over at his house to give them a tour of his rain garden, and they were interested. They're always looking for places to visit, so they're glad to visit new gardens. David Dye gave a presentation at a local school, and many rain gardeners have been starting to do this. Schools are actually mandated to do education about uh, good practices for stormwater, so they would be more than welcoming to have you come and give a presentation in a class. Or if you want to get really ambitious, because this is, you know, coordinating with a lot of people and parents and things like that, is building a rain garden at a local school. Also, some people may not have a yard. You know, if you don't have a yard, if you live in a condo or in an apartment, or um, maybe you just can't get other people in your family to help you, <laughs> it's okay. You can also earn your Master Rain Gardener certification by adopting a public rain garden. Public rain gardens, I can guarantee you there is one in your, in your municipality, in your community, that needs some tender loving care. And by weeding it and making it look great, you are doing your ambassador job. Also, you can give feedback to new master rain gardeners once you have earned your degree. So um, 
uh, that and you're benefiting from them giving you feedback on your garden and you'll be able to pay it forward by doing it to the next generation. Okay, so you may have had some questions. Um, Katie, has any questions come in that we should answer right here? John in Sio Township wants to know if you could build a rain garden in the shade. So can you build a rain garden in the shade? Um, I get this question a lot. I think for some reason people think you can only build rain gardens in the sun, but yes, you can definitely build a rain garden in the shade. And actually it's easier to garden in wet shade than it is to garden in dry shade. Dry shade is really difficult to find plants that will thrive, whereas wet shade, there's a lot of plants that will th thrive in dry shade. So yes, shade is a great place for a rain garden. Thanks so much. Thanks, Susan. Um, I just wanted to point out too that um, Katie works with a lot of uh, schools, elementary schools mostly, um, to put in rain gardens and then also developing curriculum so that they can learn their um, learn the, their required uh, skills while also working on a rain garden. And a rain garden can be a really useful tool because it's a hands-on opportunity and kids love to get outside and get digging. Okay, so we've talked about why put in a rain garden. Let me give you a story of a rain garden from start to finish. So that whole um, arc of um, how to put in a rain garden. So I'm going to talk about Denise Held is a master rain gardener from a few years ago who put in a rain garden. And here it is, real live rain garden. Um, here is an example of her doing the whole process. So remember that a rain garden takes water from the roof as well as the rain that just hits it um, from the sky. So here's the process. So the first step is to do kind of a site analysis. Where is this rain garden going to go? What's the water that it's going to capture? Where is that coming from? Is Are we going to be able to get the water from the roof to the rain garden? So first thing is where. And part of that is this, we'll go over all the different things you need to look at in excruciating detail next week. But the most important rule is it needs to be 10 feet away from the house. So you want to soak water into the ground, but you don't want to soak it in right next to the house because you don't want the water to get into your basement. So stay 10 feet away from your house, and that's anywhere around there is a good place to put a rain garden. If you've been having issues with water in your basement, you might even make that a little bit further. You might make it 15 feet away from your house. So keep that in mind. All right, so also how big does it need to be to capture all that water? This is a little spoiler alert, but it's about 20% of the roof area, but we will go into lots and lots of detail about that later. Um, and then also, Denise had a bunch of extra plants from her other gardens that she had divided. So she had a lot of raw material to figure, to figure out like where these plants could go and which ones of them might be appropriate for a rain garden. So those are some of the things that we get, some of the information that we gathered. We also did an infiltration test, and you'll be doing this too. You dig a hole in the ground about 18 inches deep, fill it up with water, let it drain down, and then fill it up with water again, and then time it. So how long does it take for, for that water to drain down? And the range is anywhere from 15 minutes to four days or longer. You know, eventually it evaporates. Um, and don't worry about exactly where you are in that continuum. We've had people build rain gardens on clay sites, and they've worked fine. So don't worry too much. It's really more of a tool for this is how you're going to pick plants. If you're on the clay side, you're going to need to pick plants that are adapted to clay. Um, so that's something that you read on the internet, like you can't put a rain garden in clay, you can. And we've done it many, many times. Um, so that's why you're paying, it, paying us the big bucks to learn <laughs> little tidbits like that. Um, and then here's the example of the, this is the rain garden that she, actually Shannon Gibrandle, who you'll be hearing from in a little bit, designed for Denise. It's a beautiful plan. Where is she going to put all those plants? How the, is the water going to get to the rain garden? And then also it's nice to have some pictures of those plants so that Denise knew what she, you know, what was going to be blooming when, that sort of thing. So it goes down this downspout and right into this little garden right there. So that's the rain garden. You can see it's actually not that deep. And that's sort of a misnomer. People think that rain gardens are, you know, two, three feet deep. No, no, no. We're talking six inches. And even though there is quite a bit of digging, to get it to look like this because you're going to dig down so that it's lower than the four inch pipe and then four inches of standing water and then a couple of inches for compost but then once you add that compost back in and then put mulch on it it actually it doesn't look that deep it looks like a 
garden bed, it doesn't look like anything else is going on here. So that's why we also give you a sign, is once you've planted it, it just looks like a garden bed. All right, and then the next spring, there it is looking beautiful, blooming, that's penstemon blooming there. A little bit uh, later in the summer, that's nodding wild onion, purple coneflower, and some daylilies. Um, hot lips turtle head is the pink flower and then sweet autumn clematis is the white and then even later in the summer some of that wild geranium turns a beautiful red so the garden can look beautiful in all the different seasons just like a normal perennial garden so Denise built that first rain garden herself and she loved it so she wanted to learn how to design these rain gardens herself so we offered that first master rain gardener class and she got to learn how to do it herself so this is the plan for a new rain garden that she designed um, and you can see that it doesn't look like quite like what Shannon's looked like but the garden is going to be just as beautiful because Denise knows what she's doing all right so um, you can see on this in this photo that she's just digging it and I just want to point out that the water comes down the downspout and then goes into this first pool and then when that fills up it goes into the second pool so this is kind of a fancier than the first one and there's a second pool of water right here so even though once the plants are all growing up you can't really see this I just wanted to point this out when she's still digging that there's basically you want a couple of shallow pools or just one shallow pool but that's the idea behind a rain garden is it um, is the water goes into it and then pools a little bit then of course she plants it with all the plants from her other gardens and she bought a few I think that's blue lobelia in the white pots there and there it is all planted the fruit of her labor all done and you can see that the water comes down the downspout on the right into that first pool you can see the pipe kind of peeking out into the garden there and then it overflows into the second pool and then anything that overflows that because you know sometimes we get huge gully washers then that'll then that'll overflow just onto the grass so the rain garden captures that water there it is in spring the next spring I think we have some iris in there and columbine and some allium some penstemon I think she put Asiatic lilies in there that's you know she's doing some fancy stuff in there and um, this photo which is kind of late in the summer I just want to point out how parched that grass looks that is some seriously parched grass and I think it's because well it hadn't rained for a long time so those plants in the rain garden are adapted to both drought and wet so they're looking fantastic also any tiny little rain that might have happened the on captured from the whole roof goes into the garden so automatically the garden gets watered which is fantastic as a lazy gardener myself I just want to approve of that um, and then there it is she keeps improving it so she built a little decorative wall in front of it recently and it's just looking you know more and more pretty as she gardens Shannon Gib Randall is the principal of Insight Design Studio here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She's a landscape architect who focuses on the beautiful use of native plants and creative stormwater management. She's designed uh, landscapes of all scales, like here's maybe a smaller project for you, Shannon, yeah. the, the Eastern Michigan University Family Housing Rain Gardens, all the way up to big projects like Ann Arbor City Hall. And this is the main welcoming garden of the, the entrance to City Hall. And this garden, plus some other features around the site, capture all of the water that falls on the roof or anywhere on the site, captures all of it and soaks it into the ground, which is a pretty amazing feat when it comes to a very urban setting. Oh, and also, um, you've designed a few rain gardens for your kids' school, too. Yeah, so yeah. we'll talk about that a little bit as well, sure. I think, later in the class. All right, so what are the four plants that are plants of the day, Shannon? Okay, so four plants of the day. So we're going to be doing this segment every class. Um, we're also going to have a whole class kind of devoted to design and, and working with plants. But we're trying to break it up into little chunks so that it's not so overwhelming because plant the whole you know compendium of plants can feel a, a little too much all at once. So we're trying to break it up. 
So this first list of plants that we have for you are the real slam dunk plants. You will not go wrong with these plants. They will work for you, whatever, so, uh, whatever your circumstances. So uh, this is the, the first class we're going over plants like that. So the uh, plant number one is blue flag iris or iris virginica. And I think that I have used this plant in every single rain garden I have ever designed. And I've designed many, many, many of them. So this is why I love this plant. Um, it will grow in crazy wet, even if you have a, like a lot of standing water that you know you have really, really difficult soils. Uh, this plant will grow in. I mean, it's a, it's basically a wetland obligate plant they call it. So it can handle super wet. However, it can handle drier than you'd think, given it given that it's a a wetland obligate plant. So I have used this in drier areas within the rain garden too or even sandier soils and it's been totally fine. It has a much wider range than you'd ever suspect. Um, it has a gorgeous blue flower that comes out kind of late May, early June and uh, it will grow in the sun, it'll grow in part shade, it'll grow in the shade. Now in the shade shade, it doesn't produce as many flowers but that's okay because here you can see it massed and you can see what that foliage looks like. So it's got this strappy long foliage that is very neat. And in the um, kind of encyclopedia of, of rain garden plants, uh, there aren't a ton that are super neat. And so uh, because Iris virginica can handle so many different things and it has the neat quality too, it is a real winner for us. So uh, we have used this plant over and over and over again with great success and on top of all of that, the deer don't eat it. So for those of you that are dealing and that you're living in rural areas or even in suburban areas where deer are becoming a real issue, um, they just stay away from this one. So it's a fabulous plant, blue flag iris or iris virginica. The next plant is fox sedge or Carex vulpinoidea. Now this is not got a big showy flower, um, but it will also grow in sun, part sun, or shade. It's a little less robust looking in the shade, but it will grow there. Not in like the deepest of deep shade, but um, it really does, it's very adaptable. Many sedges um, grow in rain gardens, however, the vast majority of them will look great in the spring and great in the fall, but they'll kind of flop in the in the midsummer. And um, uh, fox sedge really stays very perky for a sedge all the way through. It gets to be about two, maybe three feet tall, something like that. It's a very neat little fountain effect. Um, and the other, it also is not eaten by the deer, but it's big quality that um, for any of you that are dealing with any kind of runoff from a road or a parking lot, this will take salt. And that is a really short list of plants that will take salt. So if you are doing any Anything that has anything to do with the road for your rain garden, you need to include this plant because it really is a wonderful workhorse for you. It deals with the, the wettest part uh, well. It'll handle medium too, but um, it handles the wettest part the best. I feel like that's the most um, challenging part of a rain garden planting yeah. plan as well, is that l the wettest part of the bottom of the rain garden. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. those two do fantastically. Yeah, they really do. Yeah. So our next plant is something that is not so much super wet bottom of the rain garden. This is wild geranium or geranium maculatum. It's one of our woodland uh, native wildflowers. Many of our woodland wildflowers look amazing in the spring and then they just kind of poop out in the summer. They go totally dormant and then you, you, they absolutely disappear. Wild geranium does not do that. It stays perky, it grows even in the dry shade, um, and its leaves are very neat and it's uh, very short too, like you know, a foot, maybe 18 inches if it's just like screamingly happy, but it really uh, stays very short and neat. Uh, you'd never kind of think of it as a native plant in terms of kind of the, um, sometimes their reputation is a little, a little raggedy looking. This plant has nothing about it that is raggedy whatsoever. It has a beautiful uh, lavender flower in the spring. 
and it's more the sides of your rain garden though if you have pretty well draining soils you could put this at the bottom just not in the wettest part um, but it's another great plant again the deer don't eat it which is a, a big huge issue for many people so a plant that we use over and over again shade part shade I wouldn't pull it put it in eight hours of Sun it doesn't quite like that much it is really from the woods in terms of its heritage so um, but if it gets like five hours and then gets some shade then it's probably okay so um, this is this is another wonderful plant um, and then in the fall actually if it is in that sunnier location then it also has just gorgeous leaves so that's another uh, real um, advantage to this plant so it's the last, it really is. It's oh, I was just going to mention that um, these are all native to Michigan plants that we're highlighting here. Yeah. And these have been sifted through so that the most beautiful ones. <laughs> right. <laughs> because there are plenty of native plants that are not really garden worthy, shall we say. Or um, not garden worthy on a small scale. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. many of the rain garden plants, you know, many of them are kind of in a small, you know, your rain garden doesn't need to fill up your whole yard. You know, it's kind right. of a smaller area. And so having a nine foot, you know, big blue stem grass, which would actually love being in a rain garden, mm -hmm. um, it, we've found over time that people have not been so into the really tall ones so we have really focused this is over time of listening to feedback over the last uh, I guess 18 years that we've been doing this um, you know we've kind of figured out which ones people like and don't like and we'd love to hear back from you all too about what your aesthetic preferences are for some of these things and what your own experiences um, because that's how we learn too so make sure you're giving us feedback on these things um, but the native plants really do uh, the, the native ones that are suited to this kind of habitat really are amazing at absorbing uh, that water and so that's why we rely on them and because they are offer excellent habitat opportunities to in your yard so that's I'm glad you broke in Susan to mention that um, our last plant of the day is called red twig dogwood and uh, this is another just like super tough plant that will grow in the sun, part sun, shade. In the shade, it's a little more open. Um, and this is another one that will handle a huge range of conditions. I would say out of all the plants I just highlighted, this one has the most robust range out there. I have seen it growing in completely, utterly flooded areas next to rivers, uh, certainly in moist areas. And I was just over Lake Michigan over the holiday, and I saw it growing straight out of dune sand. So, I mean, come on. That's an amazing range for a plant. So uh, you can put it wherever you want. The thing about it is that it does get big. So you have to be able to plan for that. Um, and it can go, uh, again, wet, moist, dry. Um, the thing about it, though, is that it has, because it's so, it's such a great shrub, and Susan, if you go to the next slide, you'll see why it's so interesting, um, and that is, this is the color of its new growth. It is brilliant red. It's really striking, and boy, what a nice way to kind of pep up the winter landscape, which, you know, we're dealing with for a long time in this state. Um, so it's, it's very striking, and because of that, um, there have been a lot of horticulturists out there that have bred it into what they call different cultivars, different sort of versions of it. And so you can see that there's um, ones that are variegated, which means they have like a white leaf margin. Uh, this one's a little uh, a little shorter. This is called Elegantissima, and it is, um, it's maybe like six feet tall, whereas the straight species may get to be 10 feet tall. It's really tall. Um, there are some uh, that are actually have yellow twigs instead of the red twigs. So there's all different kinds of um, uh, cultivars of this plant too. So you can go with the straight native or you can go with the cultivars. It really is something that is very tough. The one thing I just want to be able to tell you about is that uh, in order to keep that brilliant color that really is on the first year's growth. So in order to achieve that consistently, what you can do is actually trim it back about by a third um, every year and those new stems will keep coming out so uh, you can keep up that intense color during winter and that's one of the reasons that we love this plant. So yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shannon. Those sure. are 
I think, you know, if you planted a garden with just those four plants, it'd be a fine garden. It would work yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but then, of course, there's all sorts of other plants that you could oh, put yes. in just to make it more interesting. <laughs> right. Oh, yes. <laughs> Some people really want to cut to the chase, but that's right. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, and we appreciate all your expertise, Shannon. Shannon's going to be back every single week with us, giving us expertise on plants, and then also expertise on some of the more challenging sites um, that we'll be working on. So thank you so much. Yeah. All right, next up is homework. What? There's homework for this class? There is. That's how step-by-step step, we'll give you homework that's really easy, but by the end you'll have designed your entire rain garden. Your homework this week is to take some photos of the place where you're thinking about putting a rain garden. And you don't know all the rules about where to put a rain garden. The most important one you'll remember is to do it 10 feet away from your house and away from your neighbor's house, just as important. Um, so you'll have, you, next week we're actually going to go over detailed what to do with, during your site analysis, but you probably have some idea where you're thinking about putting this rain garden. So your job is to take some photos of that site and then post it for feedback on either the Facebook Master Rain Gardener group or the Garden Web House Great Lakes Gardening Forum, one of those two places. And this also will kind of just get you in and you'll get used to the the um, format there. And for your garden, st this is important, start a new thread and then all of the photos and comments and things and plans that you're going to post in that same thread. So that way when I read it, I'll know like this is your house, this is your plan, I'll be able to see everything all in the same place. Very important. Please make my life a little easier. Um, but also there will be other uh, Master Rain Gardener alumni who will also comment and they'll introduce themselves to, to you a little bit like, oh, I, I know I built one two years ago and feel free to take their advice or not, you know, you can do what you want. Um, okay, so also I'm going to send you a quiz and um, this will be a Survey Monkey quiz and I'm just going to tell you all the questions right now so don't get worried and actually I'm going to send you out an email with links to the groups and also with a link to this quiz and I'm going to include what the questions are going to be with the answers. So, but it's closed book, so close out that email before you actually take the quiz. Here are the questions. What is a rain garden? How does it function? And what are the benefits? Just so you get a little practice answering those questions. All right. Um, also on the quiz will be name two plants that will grow in rain gardens in both shade and sun. You'll remember blue flag iris wild geranium. The second question, name a grass-like texture plant that will grow in a rain garden in both shade and sun. You'll remember that's fox sedge. And name a shrub that will grow in a rain garden, red twig dogwood. So look, you have the answers right there. Also this weekend, Sunday, we're going to visit Leslie Kalman's two rain gardens here in Ann Arbor, and that'll be also be in the email. Uh, she has two beautiful rain gardens and is a wonderful plants woman, so we'll learn a lot from Leslie. And all together for everyone, we're going to visit Wild Type Nursery. It is, I'd say, the premier native plant nursery in Michigan. They sell all local genotype natives, so what a wonderful resource we have. They grow everything from seed that they gather in the wild. So it's an amazing place. Owner Bill Schneider will be giving us a tour and pointing out those natives that are appropriate for rain gardens. So won't that be fun? Um, Nuha was asking if putting a rain garden in the sandy clo soils close to a beach is a good idea, and I am answering her right now saying yes, especially if you live on a lake, actually capturing your stormwater from the roof or the driveway or the, you know, sometimes there's a dirt road next to the um, lake, capturing that before it goes into the water is fantastic because then you, you clean it before it gets to the water. And people who live on a lake are often, um, even one of the Great Lakes or one of our smaller inland lakes, you get to see the results right away. You get to see that your um, lake is cleaner, and that's great because we're all swimming in it, and, you know, things like that. So, yeah, especially if you're living on a lake or on the river, those are great places to put um, uh, rain gardens. Even if it's, you're like, wow, it's, you know, it's beach sand, basically, you know, what am I doing here? But capturing it before it erodes and goes into the uh, river, into the lake is a best practice. That's the gold standard. Yeah. Do you see any other ones there? Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so Erica um, Lakowski was saying, she was, is it worth trying to cave out a hilled berm 
Right now I have non-rain garden plants in my hilled berm, but would love to have it capture rain instead of running off. We might have to look at photos because I'm yeah. not sure what she means. Some things you can't really describe in words. You need to see it. Um, right. So it sounds like a lot of digging to me. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> got a berm. It doesn't mean it can't be done. It's right. more that it sounds like a lot of physical work to be able to put it in a spot like that. Um, but if you send photos, and, and I, sometimes photos are hard because they're two-dimensional and it's tricky to see it, but a berm might, you know, if it's uh, more dramatic, might show up in a photo. Um, and yeah. next week we'll actually go over a lot. Um, Susan covers great content with sort of where to put a rain garden, where not to put a rain garden, and so um, after seeing that lecture, you might um, be able to get a sense of, you know, looking around your yard where it makes most sense to put one. But my first reaction is, wow, digging up a berm to make it into a rain garden sounds like a lot of digging, but it may be the only spot for you too, you know. So, um, and and we often find like berms in between properties that. Like, boy, if they just depressed this thing, we could have made a great rain garden in between, you know. So I hear what you're saying because sometimes that is the yeah. logical place to put it. Uh, so it depends on if you have a strapping uh, teenager to help you, maybe, is, is what <laughs> it probably comes down to. <laughs> right. So somebody help you dig that thing. That's right. Uh, That's right. I see um, another question here that says, "Do porous pavers withstand the constant freeze thaw of our winters?" So that's a that's a good question. So porous pavers basically work by um, the the pavers themselves are not porous. It's the gaps in between the pavers that are porous. So instead of using a kind of really fine grained sand in between as the filler material, you're using something that's um, uh, kind of more gravelly and has a lot of pore space in between, but is still kind of holding up the um, uh, the physical integrity of, of the bricks, um, of the pavers themselves, but underneath the pavers is another reservoir area where the pavers sit on top of this very angular aggregate that still has a pretty big void ratio in it, anywhere from 30 to 40 percent, and that's where that water will sit. So um, in terms of it withstanding winters, um, it's a good question because if that area were to kind of fill up completely with water and it weren't well draining, then you would get freeze thaw. And it all kind of comes down to, in a way, like what those pavers, what the soil um, is like that those pavers are sitting on. So if you have uh, super well draining sand, it's going to work great. If you have pretty medium good, you know, well draining soils, then I think it'll probably work just fine. If you have really heavy clay, then that might be a problem. And in fact, I don't even recommend putting porous pavers on clay at all because really all you're doing is kind of holding water underneath uh, that paver area because um, when soils are really heavy like that, the water just really doesn't penetrate. So um, if you have kind of medium to well-drained soils, then it'll withstand it just fine. And if you have it on heavy clay, basically the, the manufacturers recommend that you put in an underdrain. And so that's how it's draining. And by that time, it's kind of what's the point of having um, pavers in there in the first place if you're just draining it all off anyway. So that's that's my two cents about how porous pavers uh, react to uh, winter conditions. The other nice thing about them though is that you don't have to salt as much because the um, the water will, it, it'll, it'll basically has the ability to go down, it has the ability to just infiltrate right away. So uh, that's another um, advantage of having a porous um, pavement system in the wintertime. It doesn't form ice in the same way. Yeah, I have um, porous concrete in my driveway and there's never any ice on it. It just goes right through. So when my elderly parents visit, they don't, there's no ice to slip on, which is fantastic. That's great. Do you see any also other that, questions? Um, also, with porous pavers, um, that's why rain gardens are better because you can use them on clay, whereas porous paving right. doesn't work so great. Right, yeah. Can I just add one more thing here oh, yeah. that I think is a really good um, point? Somebody talked about loving the sedges. Um, ah, yeah. And they said another clarification is that uh, should I avoid using grass clippings to mulch? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Do not put your grass clippings in your rain garden. This is why. Because in your grass clippings are grass seeds. And 
you will fight it like nobody's business if you start putting grass seed into your rain garden. And in fact, we have this whole thing when we work with contractors that maintain rain garden areas in our public facilities. We have to do this whole training with them about the direction of the mowing around the rain garden or stormwater area because what we want is them to throw their mulch clippings away from the rain garden, not into the rain garden because if they do that, oh my gosh, we are battling pulling that grass out of that rain garden forever and grass is really hard to get rid of. So find a different spot. It's wonderful that you're um, wanting to not just dump them in the garbage get a compost, find another compost place them. Compost your, them. Yeah, that's that's the way to handle it, not put them in your rain garden. Good question, though, because you do <laughs> want nice organic material in it, right? You know, yeah, that makes compost it first, then you're yes. good. Th then you're good, that's right. Right. Okay, okay. so I'm going to send you an email with reminders about the homework, a link to the quiz, a link to the groups, and this is the end of our presentation for class number one.